Today we're going to talk about virus structure. Today's show and tell. I have viruses with me. Uh, these are, these are uh, giant microbes. This is polio, the virus I've worked my whole life on. So we'll come back to that. They give them eyes to make them uh, people friendly. This is HIV. To make it black and sinister. And I'm going to tell you why this is wrong. This is totally wrong. <laughs> And finally, this is the best. This is an actual model. I have more in my office. So when you come for office hours, you can see them all. This is polio. It's a real uh, structural model. Today, you're going to understand what this means. But the coolest part of this is inside of it is the genome. And a virology friend of mine, she, she beaded this. So there are four different color beads according to the four bases of the RNA. And they're in the right sequence. So you can see this is the, yeah, I know it's very geeky, right? But who, <laughs> who else in the world has this? Uh, this is the three prime end. You can see the poly A tail. It's red, so you know A is red. And you know, you look at this thing and you see these patterns which you would never pick up in any other way. Anyway, the whole genome is in here. 7,440 nucleotides. And we will talk more about this later and what this means. So that's really cool. All right. And it's actually almost to scale uh, the genome to the particle. So today we're going to learn about how to build those. There's only one kind of virus particle that's out there. I want you to understand how they're built, how the other kinds of virus particles are built, uh, what are the principles. Now I know there's some lights burned out here. I asked them to fix them so that you don't fall asleep on me. And hopefully before the end of the semester they will. They told me it's kind of high. And I said, well, you know, you built the building. Did you think the, the, <laughs> did you think the light bulbs would last forever? So, Hopefully they'll fix it at some point and you can see a little better. All right. So the capsid that surrounds a, a virus, like these here and many other kinds of well, have a number of functions I want you to think about. And they're listed here. Here are some pictures of viruses. Obviously they have to protect the genome. So you can see with the polio model we have here, it's a nice shell that protects the genome. It keeps it inside it as it travels from person to person or within you because the genome can be fragile. Um, so it has to be a protective protein shell. It also obviously has to recognize the nucleic acid. You don't want to put any nucleic acid into this particle as you're building it in the cell. You want viral nucleic acid. So there have to be specific recognition sequences, and we'll talk about that during assembly. Uh, and then for viruses that have an envelope around them, the proteins have to be able to interact with the envelope and allow its acquisition. None of these viruses have envelopes here. Um, I think giant microbes does make a few viruses with envelopes, but I don't have them. All right, so those are to protect the genome. And then, of course, the capsid has to deliver the genome to the right place in the cell. It's got to bind host cell receptors. That's a process we'll talk about next time. It has to uncoat the genome. This is the, the name we give to the process where the genome is released. You'll see, actually, that for some viruses, the genome actually stays in the shell. The shell is a bit degraded. Uh, but the genome stays in it. But for the most part, as far as we know, the genome gets out of the virus particle at some point so it can start uh, replicating. Uh, for some viruses that have membranes around them, like these three shown here, the membrane of the virus has to fuse with that of the cell to liberate the genome. And then the genome has to go to the right place. Some viruses, uh, the genome stays in the cytoplasm. For others, it goes to the nucleus. And the proteins that are around the genome often specify where it goes. So lots of functions. These are just some of them. And we haven't talked about all of them. Lots of function associated with these structural proteins. Now we have some definitions to get out of the way. So you know what I'm talking about. And they're shown here. Subunit is simply a single polypeptide that makes up a capsid or a virus particle. So here, for example, in blue or red or yellow, these are single polypeptide chains. They're folding in a specific way to, to make up the capsid. Uh, then we have a structural unit. You can also call this a protomer or an asymmetric unit. Uh, that's the unit from which the capsids are built. So here, uh, this is the structural unit, this triangle that you can see here on the upper right with one blue, one yellow, and one red a subunit, which is, of course, the polypeptide. So blue is a polypeptide, yellow is a polypeptide, so is red, and they come together to make a structural unit. And then you repeat that over and over to make a capsid. And the capsid is the shell surrounding the genome. So you make many, you put together many units, you make a capsid, and um, that's what these are here. These three viruses on the table are all capsids. 
That's one way to build a virus particle. Then we have something called a nucleocapsid, which every year inevitably confuses people. So a nucleocapsid, the definition is the nucleic acid protein assembly within the particle. We only call it a nucleocapsid when it's a substructure. So for example, this virus uh, has nucleic acid protein in it, and it's surrounded by an envelope. It's a distinct substructure. We call that a nucleocapsid. Now on the top right here, this is poliovirus. Uh, that is a nucleic acid protein complex, but it's not a substructure of anything. So we don't call it a nucleocapsid, we just call it a capsid. If it had an envelope around it, like this virus at the lower right, this virus has a nucleocapsid because the RNA protein complex is a substructure of the virion. So that's what a nucleocapsid is. I'll try and emphasize that more throughout today. Then, of course, the envelope is the viral membrane that surrounds some viruses. It's a host cell-derived bilayer, as I told you earlier. So it, it could be called a bilayer or an envelope. Sometimes I will use this term envelope uh, to mean that. And finally, virion is a very specific word in my usage. Virion means the infectious particle. We learned last time or a couple of lectures ago that not every virus particle made in an infectious cell is infectious. Some of them are defective. So notice I said virus particle, because virus particle comprises infectious and non-infectious particles. The virion is the one that initiates the infection. And in our book, we use that to mean that other people don't do it. But again, as I told you, when, when you write a big book about viruses, you have to be consistent with your terminology. And this is the one that we have adopted. All right, those are the, the terms. Now, let's talk about size a little, because I throw out angstroms and nanometers and microns a lot, and sometimes I get confused. I think I misspoke in an earlier lecture as well. So let's, let's look at that here. Nanometer, of course, is 10 to the minus 9 meters. It's a billionth of a meter. A nanometer can be 10 angstroms, or is 10 angstroms, or 0 0.001 microns. 1,000 nanometers would be a micron. So mostly in, in structural virology, we talk about um, microns and nanometers. So alpha helix in a protein, for example, which is shown here on the right, is about a nanometer in diameter. That's the diameter of the whole alpha helix. And you can see the gray, uh, the, that's the alpha carbon backbone there with the side chains coming off. DNA is a little bigger, two nanometers in diameter. You see a double helix here, two nanometers across. Uh, a ribosome on the lower right, which is labeled G, it's about 20 nanometers in diameter. These things are obviously not to scale. And poliovirus is shown below the ribosome. That's about 30 nanometers in diameter. So on the table here, um, here's poliovirus. There's two polioviruses here exactly, actually. And these would be 30 nanometers. Obviously, the giant microbe's different from this one because they didn't consult me when they made their fuzzy uh, viruses. Uh, the HIV is bigger than that, than that right there. It's not 30 nanometers. It should be a little bigger. Anyway, uh, the, the smallest viruses are 20 to 30 nanometers in diameter. The biggest ones, Pandora virus, which is shown here, is 1,000 nanometers in diameter, about a micron long. All right, it's the biggest one we know of. And obviously, that's not the scale. It should be bigger than the, uh, the slide itself. All right, so those are the terms we're going to be using. Another concept I want you to wrap your head around is the idea that virus particles are what we call metastable. They have uh, a stable form where they protect the genome, and they have an unstable form where they come apart and release the genome. So that poliovirus on the table with the RNA coming out, that, that represents the metastable form. And the gray poliovirus is the stable form. So that's the form that travels among hosts and within you. But at some point, it's got to release the genome. So that's why we call them metastable. They have stable and unstable properties. That's all that means for virology. And that's kind of diagrammed on this slide. We have a stable virus particle initiating infection. Uh, it's very stable, it protects the genome, and then in the cell, at some point, it's releasing the genome. That's the unstable part of the life cycle. So here's a slide that expounds on this a little more with a graph. Now what we say about a virus particle in its stable form, like the gray poliovirus here, we say it hasn't reached its minimum free energy conformation. It still has energy in the bonds that are building that virus, and 
to get to the minimum free energy confirmation, you'd have to release that, and that's the process of uncoding. To get there is not straightforward. To get to the minimum free energy confirmation, viruses typically have to surmount an energy barrier, and that's diagrammed here, where we're looking at energy on the y-axis and different states on the x-axis, different states of the virus particle. So the state number three in blue is the minimum free energy confirmation. The energy's gone, and there is the unstable form of the particle where it's releasing its genome. State number one is the virus particle, say, as it's built in a cell, a brand new virus particle is made. It's, it has a certain energy level. It's not at its minimum free energy level, and that's the stable form. And to get from stable to the unstable form from one to three, you have to pass over a little barrier there. Uh, and that's typically the, the process that we'll talk about during uncoding. And that's probably a good idea to have this barrier so that viruses don't just simply start spewing out their nucleic acids as soon as they're made. You have to have some trigger for them to do that. When you build a virus, again, to summarize this, you build a virus particle, you put energy into it. That's assembly. And we also, another word we use for this is spring-loaded. We call a virus particles spring-loaded because the energy that's built into them is used to disassemble the particle upon the right trigger or the right signal in the cell. And typically, uh, for example, receptor binding in a cell or low pH or a protease is a signal for disassembly of the particle. So it releases that energy, the particle comes apart, and the nucleic acid comes out. Now, if I were to take out this genome on this poliovirus, this beaded genome, it would take me about a minute, because it's all tangled and thick. But in fact, in a cell, it comes out in a microsecond. It's all coordinated, high energy process. It's really remarkable. It's actually something we don't know very well or understand very well. All right, so that's the concept of metastability. Now, you may be wondering, how do you do this? How do you build a virus that has these two states? Well, you start with the stable part of that, of that uh, life cycle, if you will. And as we'll see in a few moments, virus capsids, at least, which, which are shown here on this slide, they're created by symmetrical arrangement of identical proteins. So that gives you maximum contact among the proteins, so it makes you a very stable capsid. Not all viruses have capsids, of course. There are envelope viruses, but then the glycoproteins, as we'll see later, also have stable and unstable forms as well. The unstable structure can happen because typically these subunits in the particle are not covalently bound. They are non-covalent interactions that hold all the protein subunits together. So upon infection, they're easy to take apart. There are actually some interesting exceptions to this of some viruses that actually have covalently linked proteins in their capsids, they use other strategies to, to, get a, to get their nucleic acid out of there. But for the most part, all the viruses we'll consider in this course, the, the subunits are non-covalently bound, so they can easily come apart on the right signal. And whatever, what the signal is, is the topic of the next lecture. Today we're going to just talk about how we build uh, these virus particles. All right, our first question. Viral capsids are metastable because a, they must protect the viral genome outside of the cell. B, they must come apart and release the genome in a cell. Uh, they have not obtained a minimum free energy conformation. D, they are spring-loaded, or E, all of the above. 82% of you got all of the above, because that's right. They must protect the genome, they must come apart and release the genome, and they have not obtained a minimum free energy conformation. Those are some of the things I told you in the previous slides. So go back and, and look at that again because these are all reasons why virus particles are metastable. Now we're going to talk a little bit now about how viruses are built, but before we do that, I just want to go briefly over some of the methods that we use to study structure of viruses. This is because we'll, I'll be mentioning them over and over. You'll see structures throughout this course that are obtained in different ways. I want you to understand it. These are the main tools we use, electron microscopy, <coughs> x-ray crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy, or cryo-electron tomography, and NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Those of you who have the textbook, this is all described in chapter four. I don't want you to know by heart these methods. You should just understand what they can do and the differences among them. So electron microscopy started the era of modern structural virology. The electron microscope was invented in the 1930s. And here's the first paper by Helmuth Ruska, who used an electron microscope to take 
the first pictures of virus particles. And this is an early picture he took you can find on the internet. It's an E. coli studded with uh, bacteriophages. These are tailed bacteriophages with a, a head and a tail and, and tail fibers coming out from other them. So that's 1940. Here's the paper in German. And uh, that, so that started the era of people being able to look at what viruses were. In fact, up until this point, people still wondered if viruses, which were, again, defined at the end of the 1800s, they could go through a filter. Some people thought they were liquids. And this said, no, they are particulate. So this is a really important discovery. Now, electron microscopy brought us very far in understanding what viruses look like, but it has its limitations. First of all, viruses and cells that they infect have very little contrast. So to do electron microscopy, you have to stain them. But you can't use stains that we would use to stain tissues because the electrons will go right through them. You have to use a, an electron repelling stain like uh, those shown here, uranyl acetate, phosphotungstate. So what happens is you put your viruses on a grid. You can't see them, of course. And then you coat them with one of these stains. And then you put the electron beam on them. And wherever there is dye, the beam doesn't go through. So you're actually, it's, it's a negative staining. You're getting a negative image of the virus particle. And all the pictures I show you of EM of viruses are negative stained for that reason. The resolution of this technique is about 50 to 75 angstroms. That's the smallest structure you can see. And if you remember, the alpha helix is 10 angstroms in diameter. I just wanted to remind you that an angstrom is 0.1 nanometers. You can see by EM, you'll never see the alpha helix no way you're ever going to see a protein chain. So you can't do any detailed structural interpretation. But you can see what viruses look like. And when you get a new virus, uh, you can immediately look at it under the EM and say, aha, this looks like one of the viruses we've already seen. So here are some well-known viruses uh, taken by an electron microscopist, uh, microscopist in Africa. And you see, they're very beautiful. When you get very good at this, you can take lovely pictures. It's just that the information is limited. Here in the upper left is a herpes virus. And you can see this virus has a capsid. It's, that's the interesting structure in the middle there, very much like the polio capsid, only bigger. It's surrounded by a membrane. And for years, th this was how we thought herpes viruses looked. But it turns out the preparation in making this image cause an artifact so that membrane shouldn't be splayed out all over the place the way it is. It should be tighter around the particle. Uh, on, the, on the middle top, these are papillomaviruses, rather small viruses that cause cancers and warts. These are polioviruses on the upper right. Here we have hepatitis B virus. You can see it incurs in several different forms, a spherical form and also an elongated form. In the middle is a paramyxovirus. Uh, here is a rotavirus on the right a virus that causes gastroenteritis. On the lower left, adenovirus, icosahedral virus with these uh, antennae coming out from, from it, very famous image. Uh, influenza virus here, and finally, vaccinia virus. So many people studied images of viruses for many years and made catalogs. So nowadays, if you have a new disease, you could look at fluids from an infected person and say, aha, this is one of these viruses. But now to learn about viruses in detail, which we'll talk about throughout most of this course, we have to use more sophisticated techniques. And one of them uses electron microscopy, but without a dye. You get rid of that negative stain, and you just freeze the material. It turns out if you freeze viruses very quickly at very low temperatures, you don't get ice crystals, which would trash them. And that gives it, the virus particles enough contrast so that you can see details in the electron microscope. So this is cryo-electron microscopy, and on the top is a just a plain EM image, unstained, of these frozen virus particles. So you can see information there. And in cryo-EM, the idea is you take photographs of many, many different particles in a sample. And the logic is that each particle is oriented in a different position in 360 degrees. And then you use computational methods to assemble a three-dimensional image of that. It's like doing a CAT scan. You have a person lying on a bed and you put the x-ray machine around it. You capture images and the computer assembles them into a three-dimensional view of you. Same thing here, cryo-electron uh, microscopy. You take lots of pictures, you apply Fourier transforms and a various computational methods and you can assemble a three, what we call a 3D reconstruction. This is very nice, it works beautifully. There's a variation on this called cryo-electron tomography. And in that we actually tilt 
the plate on which the viruses are located, and we can take fewer pictures because we're getting uh, images from um, almost all of the particles. Now, these uh, have limited resolution. Here's a photograph of a cryo-EM structure of poliovirus bound to its cellular receptor. So the virus is in um, magenta, and the receptor is in blue. These are without the cell being present. And you can see what's going on here. This is a 21 angstrom resolution image. So obviously you can't see polypeptide chains, but you can see the overall shape of the virus particle. You can see the receptors, you know, they're elongated and they're fitting into a specific part of the virus particle. And this was work that we did years ago in collaboration with structural biologists. So that's why it's all over my cell phone and all of my podcasts and so forth. Uh, on the lower right is a a printed 3D model of the polio. When I went to give a seminar at University of Michigan a couple of years ago, they gave this to me as a gift. You know, you can print things in 3D in plastic and metal and clay. So this is a clay printing of it. It's, it's about this high. And again, it's the virus bound to its receptor and it has very, very good detail. Uh, you can see it. And again, this is on my desk. So if you come by, I can show this to you. So these are very, very beautiful images. Of course, they're colorized. We just apply color because there's no color at this level of uh, magnification. So that's a limited amount of resolution, although nowadays, just by improving the computational uh, application of the, of the coordinates, you can go from 20 angstroms to less than 5 angstroms resolution. So cryo-EM is rapidly replacing uh, crystallization, which is the next technique we'll talk about for studying structures of viruses and even proteins as well, because getting a crystal is just a pain. So crystallography, you have to take your virus or your protein and make it crystallize and get beautiful crystals that are the right shape and size. And when you pass an X-ray beam through them, the X-ray hits all the atoms and it diffracts. And depending on where the atoms are, you can deduce from the diffraction pattern the structure of the protein. So in this sample, we have an X-ray source. We're passing it through a crystal. Uh, you get a diffraction pattern, which is then uh, detected by a, a scanner on a computer. And then this is used to generate the, uh, the alpha carbon trace. In the old days, they used film for this. And if you look back at the old, the, the 1953 paper of, of Watson and Crick, where they figured out the structure of DNA, they actually have a diffraction plate uh, of DNA, which is, just looks like a bunch of dots. But you can figure it out and, and know uh, how the, the structure of the molecule is. The first virus whose structure was solved by x-ray crystallography was this one in 1978, tomato bushy stunt virus. This is an RNA virus that infects plants. And the resolution was about two angstroms on this, so much better than cryo-EM. This technology actually predated cryo-EM. This was done first, but it was very, very difficult to get things to crystallize, so cryo-EM was developed. The poliovirus structure is shown here in the two different resolutions. On the left is the X-ray crystallographic structure, about 2.9 angstroms. So you can see the alpha carbon chase a trace of the polypeptide. You can see the side chain. You can see where every atom is in this particle in three dimensions. Of course, there are thousands and thousands of atoms, so you need a computer to keep track of them. And then you can use graphic programs to generate images like this. Uh, this is a depth cued image. This is showing color as a representation of how deep the amino acids are from a certain point. So parts of this particle are white because they're high, and then other dark particles, uh, dark parts of the image, uh, that's a, these are depressions in the virus particle, and they're shown as black. You can do all sorts of coloring to indicate whatever you want with these images. Now, on the right is the virus. It's about a 21 angstrom cryo-EM image. You can see you cannot see individual polypeptides, as you can see in the x-ray structure. You get a sort of a sense of what the surface looks like, though. And, of course, if you're looking at virus interactions, that may be enough. But that has improved markedly today, so that almost to the point of where it looks like an x-ray structure. This can be done even with huge viruses. This is a giant virus, cafeteria rowan bergensis virus. And uh, it is a 300 nanometer particle. There are over 15,000 capsid proteins in these viruses. And this is a structure done by Chuan Chao at uh, UTEP. And he, tell, he still hasn't published the structure because it's so hard to get figured out. And he said, just making this movie, his, his computer just kept crashing over and over because every atom is moving. Even the ones inside are moving as you make this rolling virus particle, so it's very hard to do. So these, this was done by uh, cryo-EM, and you can do uh, amazing 
structures of really, really big viruses uh, with this approach. All right, so those are the technologies we use. Let's get back to talking about how viruses are built. Now, Watson and Crick, you know, figured out the structure of DNA, but they did one other thing that was really important for virology as well. They figured out the principles of symmetry. <clears throat> so they figured out that there are two kinds, general kinds of particles, or I should say there are two ways that virus particles are built. They are built with helical symmetry for rod-shaped viruses or platonic polyhedra symmetry for round viruses. So what, what does this mean? So on the left picture, that's an EM of tobacco mosaic virus. It's the rod-like virus we've already visited a few times, first one to be discovered. Uh, and you can see it's, it's elongated. They figured out that these are different from the icosahedral viruses or the spherical viruses shown on the right. These are polioviruses, and of course the virus up on the table there is spherical as well. So they said the spherical viruses are built with platonic symmetry. What is platonic? Like an icosahedron, that's a platonic solid. The uh, helical viruses, these rod-like viruses, are built with helical symmetry. I'm going to go into these right now, but they figured that out just by looking at pictures of virus particles and by understanding how many proteins were made or used to build each of these virus particles. So these are the symmetry rules, and we're going to go th through this for a few minutes. It'll, it'll be initially somewhat hard for you to comprehend, but if you look at it and look at the virus particles, I think you'll get it. So the symmetry rules, two rules. First of all, each subunit in a virus particle has identical bonding contacts with its neighbors. I have identical in quotes because as you'll see, as viruses get bigger, they're not so identical. They get a little bit different, but in theory, it's the same. So you have, and the reason that works is because you have lots of similar proteins repeated over and over. So you can have one, you can have a virus particle made of one protein repeated many times. That gives maximal interactions among the proteins, and that's where the symmetry comes from. And rule two, these bonding contacts are usually non-covalent. I already hinted about that in our discussion of metastability, that the virus proteins have to be joined in a non-covalent way so they come apart, and that's rule two of the simplicity. So rule two is important not only for encoding, but in the assembly process, as you'll see, if some mistake is made, if there's uh, an improper bonding, or an improper joining of, of different subunits or if a different protein is brought in by mistake, you can reverse the whole process because the bonds are not covalent. So you get error-free assembly from that. All right, two rules. Now, this turns out to have great practical value because turns out that you can produce the proteins of many viruses on their own without anything else, without any nucleic acid or any other proteins, and they will self-assemble. That's because in the primary sequence of the capsid protein or the structural protein is all the information for them to take another of their kind and assemble with them. And there are two vaccines that we use, hepatitis B virus and human papillomavirus vaccines. These are just individual proteins produced in yeast and they spontaneously assemble into capsids. And they're shown here for one of these. We call these virus-like particles because they don't have a genome. And again, you just produce one capsid protein. You could do it in yeast and eukaryotic, other eukaryotic cells, mammalian cells, you could do it in insect cells. It spontaneously makes a capsid. And that's because, again, all the information for assembly is built into the sequence and the structure of that one protein. It finds a neighbor, it assembles, and a bunch of them come together. It's really remarkable that you can make incredible assemblies like these, like the ones shown on the bench here, just by producing a protein. Now, that's not the case for every virus. Some need help for, in their assembly, as you'll see. But the principle applies that the, the symmetry rules dictate how the assembly works. So there, there are three basic kinds of ways to build a virus. And there's helical symmetry, which we're going to talk about now. There is icosahedral symmetry, which we'll talk about in a moment. And these three viruses, actually these two viruses here, polioviruses, are built with icosahedral symmetry. And then there's a third one, which is kind of funny. It's called complex because we can't see any rules that go into making it. And so each one seems to be very different. So let's cover first helical symmetry. And this is the way tobacco mosaic virus is built as well as many other viruses uh, that we know about. And here again, we take a single coat protein. So on the lower left, 
we have a curved protein. This, this yellow curved structure is a protein, and that's the subunit of the virus particle. And basically, you join a number of these together to form a helix. So here is one helix turn in the middle, and then multiple helix turn here. So you can take each protein subunit, you add another one to it, and another one, and another one, and the proteins are able to do this on their own. They can recognize each other, and again, it makes a symmetrical arrangement of proteins. Now on the top is a electron micrograph of the tobacco mosaic virus particle, and again, you can see the helical nature of the coat protein subunit. So on the bottom was the schematic, on the top is the actual virus. It's a higher, this is the, the structure solved by cryo-EM. And on the lower right, of course, is the electron micrograph. So all you see in the EM are rods. You get no information about the structure, but on the upper left, you can see the individual coat protein subunits. Now, each of these subunits also interacts with the RNA. On the right picture on the top, you can see the plus-stranded RNA in green is coiled in the middle of this virus particle. So the coat protein subunits not only interact with each other, they interact with the RNA. And as they coil around, the RNA gets coiled in the middle. So that's what we mean by helical symmetry, basically because it forms a helix. The protein and the RNA forms a helix. There are many other viruses that have this kind of symmetry, as you'll see. Now in my office, I have these magnets, which you can buy. Buckyballs are really powerful, tiny magnets, and you can use them to make a tobacco mosaic virus. And this is an old video of, of uh, many years ago where I'm taking some uh, brown ones and making uh, a helix. And basically, this is how it would work. The only thing missing, of course, is the RNA. These would be the, the protein subunits of the virus particle. So that's my original. That's one box of beads. Uh, over the years. Students have brought me gifts at the end of this course. You, that doesn't mean you have to do this, please. <laughs> and you can see on the bottom is the way, the way it is now. It's like got blue ones and pink ones, and there are actually some green ones. And now it's about this long. I used to bring it here, but it's too big to bring anymore. It just breaks. But these are very instructional because you can see exactly how to make a virus. So that is basically tobacco mosaic virus, except uh, there isn't any RNA in it, of course. There are many animal viruses that are built with helical symmetry. This is one example, Sendai virus. Now, for Sendai, and for, in fact, for all mammalian viruses with helical symmetry, the nucleocapsid is never naked. In fact, in TMV, I wouldn't call that a nucleocapsid. I would just call it a capsid because it's not a substructure. But all the animal viruses that have helical symmetry always have an envelope around them. So here is the nucleocapsid of Sendai virus. It's quite long, 1,000 nanometers. So it's, again, it's a single protein subunit which interacts with others of the same kind and with the viral RNA inside. For Sendai, which is related to measles virus, uh, these are all wrapped in a membrane. So the lower picture is an electron micrograph. And you can see this, this virus particle is broken open, and the nucleocapsid is spilling out. So you can see that's the helical nucleocapsid, which is diagrammed above. And it's normally packaged in an envelope. So in mammalian viruses, these are never naked as they are for tobacco mosaic virus. They always have an envelope. And that makes them, that, that allows us to call them a nucleocapsid because they're a substructure within an envelope. Whereas tobacco mosaic virus is just a capsid. I know this is semantics, but that's the way it is. And that's the way I'm going to be using this terminology. All right, so there are lots of other viruses that look like this. Here, here's another one. This is rabies virus. Rabies, I've been showing you in pictures so far, this bullet-shaped uh, diagram. And basically, this consists of a nucleocapsid in the center. Again, an RNA protein complex, just like we've been talking about for TMV and Sendai. Uh, and it has an envelope around it. And it happens to be bullet-shaped. Uh, and this is an EM on the left of this bullet-shaped particle. And this, these EM pictures were used to reconstruct the particle by cryo-EM. And that's what's shown here uh, in this very colorful diagram. So the nRNA complex, N is the subunit of the, of the nucleocapsid, is wrapped up with RNA in a coiled approximation. And for, for whatever reason, it, be, it forms a bullet at one end. So one end of this helix is closed, as opposed to those I've shown you of Sendai and tobacco mosaic virus. And this has another layer of protein on top of it called the M protein, uh, and then a lipid on top of that as well. So again, these subunits of these nucleocapsids are RNA binding proteins. And here's a single RNA binding protein here. So this would be the nucleocapsid protein on the right uh, of uh, rabies virus. And there's a small piece of RNA 
shown bound to it. And on the next panel on the left, there's just multiple subunits of that nucleocapsid protein bound to a longer RNA, approximating what's going on in the virion. So again, all these viruses are built with the same symmetry. It's helical symmetry, whereas where you have the nucleic acid bound to a single protein repeated over and over in a helical structure. There are many viruses that have this kind of symmetry, and they're shown here. The ones with negative strand genomes are shown here. So on the top, we have the paramyxoviruses. These include measles virus and mumps virus. These are human pathogens. And Sendai, which I showed you as an example from this family, is a mouse virus. So that's, there you have it up there. The helical nucleocapsid within the envelope. Rabies virus, which we just showed you. The influenza viruses are also built with helical symmetry. Uh, here, the genome is in pieces. The genome is segmented. Uh, eight segments of RNA, each built with helical symmetry, proteins wrapped around RNA, and then the whole thing is encased in an envelope. Ebola viruses are also built in this manner. Uh, these are filamentous particles, but inside them is a nucleocapsid of protein bound to RNA with an envelope around it. For each of these viruses, the RNA protein complex is the nucleocapsid. It is a substructure of the particle. It is encased in an envelope, so we call it a nucleocapsid. And again, tobacco mosaic virus, we, don't, we just call it a capsid because it's not a substructure. All right, the next question is, which of the following describes virus symmetry and self-assembly? A, the bonding contacts are usually covalent. B, each subunit always has identical bonding contacts with its neighbors. C, the bonding contacts of subunits are usually non-covalent. Uh, D, each subunit has different bonding contacts with its neighbors. E, none of the above. So which describes symmetry and self-assembly? All right, so we have a division here. 46% of you said B, each subunit always has identical bonding contacts. And then 53% of you said C, the bonding contacts are usually non-covalent. Now, the answer, the correct answer is C. So obviously I didn't teach this to you properly. So let me go back to a slide where I think this has it. The correct answer is C. Usually the bonding contacts are usually non-covalent, right? That is the correct one. Usually is the key word. The, pro the problem with the one above has identical. I, I remember I told you that um, had identical in quotes. Let me, let me find the slide where that was. And that will become more obviously, more obvious as we talk about uh, this, this symmetry. So each subunit has, quote, identical bonding contacts. And I said, and this was probably too fleeting for you to pick up, so I understand that. Um, there are cases where it's not really identical. As we get bigger and bigger viruses, the, the interactions are not identical. So that's why that isn't the right answer. But it will become clear to you, I think, as we continue now. Because we're going to go now to the spherical viruses. So we've just been talking about making rod-shaped viruses that have helical symmetry. But obviously not all viruses are rod-shaped. So look on the desk here. You have spherical viruses. However, the proteins that make up viruses, whether they be rod-shaped or spherical, are not spherical. Here's the example on, on the uh, left side here of a capsid protein of poliovirus called VP1. It's not, it's not spherical. It's got an odd shape. So how do you make a spherical virus? Here's the spherical virus on the right. And um, so there are two clues that led investigators to the answer to this question. One is that all the viruses with round capsids, right, not the elongated ones like tobacco mosaic virus, all the viruses with round capsids have a precise number of proteins. It's not random at all. They're typically multiples of 60, like 60, 180, 249, 60, et cetera. So that was one clue. They got this from studying the composition of virus particles. Clue number two, you can get spherical viruses of many sizes. You can have 20, 30 nanometers. You can have um, 300 nanometer spherical particles, 10 times bigger. But the capsid proteins are pretty much the same size. The capsid proteins don't get any bigger, in other words, as you make a bigger virus. So these two clues were taken by two investigators uh, in the 60s, Casper and Klug, and they, they answered the problem. They knew from Watson and Crick's work that round capsids are made only with icosahedral symmetry. So of all the platonic solids, 
that you could pick from, and there are many besides icosahedra, the way virus is built only uses icosahedral symmetry. And finally, they figured out that capsid subunits were typically arranged as hexamers and pentamers. Now you'll see what all of this means in a moment. They figured out how to build uh, round capsids like these here from proteins that were not round. So let's see how that's done. So the answer, of course, is an icosahedral symmetry. And they said this is the only platonic solid that's used to build virus particles, not any of the other. An icosahedron is a solid with 20 faces. And each of them is an equilateral triangle. So here's an icosahedron diagrammed here. It's got 20 faces. That's the face with the little red diamond in the middle, triangle. That's, an, that's a triangular face, equilateral triangle. The sides are the same length. There are 20 of these put together to build an icosahedron. It turns out that that kind of an arrangement allows the formation of a closed shell, which is, of course, where the capsid is, with the smallest number of identical subunits. You could have 60 proteins. You can have the same protein repeated 60 times and make a shell that's very stable. And you can't do this with any of the other platonic solids. So that is probably why icosahedral symmetry has, been, uh, has evolved as the way to build these spherical viruses. Now, I just want to emphasize that this is symmetry. Um, the particle is actually spherical. So the poliovirus I have here, you can see, is spherical. It's built with icosahedral symmetry. But many people seem to want to portray viruses as icosahedra. So the polio here made by uh, giant microbes, you know, it's got, it's got the equilateral triangles on it. But that's not the way it looks. In the, in the HIV, which uh, shouldn't have any uh, icosahedral symmetry, you can also see has the points of icosahedron. I want you to remember that. These are spherical viruses. They're just built. That just means that the proteins are arranged with icosahedral symmetry. So this picture of an icosahedron is not what a virus looks like. That's just to describe the symmetry to you so you can understand it. Now, when you take 20 equilateral triangles and you build an icosahedron, you get what we call rotational axes of symmetry. And all that means is that if you draw an axis into the icosahedron, you get E equal things around it. So for example, there's a five-fold axis. All that means is that there are five equilateral triangles around it. There are also three-fold axes and two-fold axes as well. And they're shown here in different views on this slide. The reason I'm telling you this is because I'll say in a, in a lecture or two, uh, the, the receptor for poliovirus uh, binds around the five-fold axis of symmetry. And unless you know what a five-fold axis is, you're going to have no idea what I'm talking about. Now, it's very easy to find. And this, this particle I have is colored one, two, three, four, five blue subunits. That's the five-fold axis of symmetry. So the receptor would be binding around that. And the, the other axes of symmetry are colored here as well. So that's what the, the axes of symmetry mean. All right, let's see how to build a particle. See, here's a spherical particle. That's actually how they look because the proteins don't order into a very nice icosahedron. The simplest virus particle is made of 60 proteins. And they could be the same protein. In fact, we have examples of viruses. And on this spherical uh, representation, each protein is shown as a comma. Right? And there's a reason for us to do that. That's to show that all of these protein subunits uh, interact identically, either head to head or tail to tail. All right? So this is an example of identical interactions among the, sub among the subunits that make up the particle. Now, I think you can see. On this spherical representation, you see an equilateral triangle in dotted lines. So that's one triangle. Uh, so that's one equilateral face of the icosahedral symmetry. And you can see there are three protein subunits within it. There's a threefold axis of symmetry shown in red. And there is a fivefold axis shown in green. There are simply five protein subunits around it. Right, so that's the simplest virus particle. And here's an example of that uh, adeno associated virus or parvovirus. These are small DNA containing viruses. The representation on the upper right shown here in icosahedron, they have a single stranded DNA genome. They're relatively small. Uh, it's 25 nanometer particle made of 60 copies of a single capsid protein. So that's it on the right there. That is one capsid protein repeated 60 times using these symmetry rules. And you can see you get a spherical capsid. And I think you can find the five-fold axis of symmetry. It's in blue. It's surrounded by 
one, two, three, four, five uh, parts of that uh, protein subunit. So that is the simplest way we can build a virus. Now, uh, you've seen in the last few slides this number T equals something. That'll be obvious in a moment. I'll talk about that. But this particle has a T equals one <laughs> symmetry. All right, now we know that not all viruses are the same size. We go from 20 nanometers to 300. So how do you make a bigger virus particle? The proteins don't get bigger. You simply add more subunits into the particle. You pack more in. That's how you make a bigger virus particle. Now here you can see a slightly bigger virus particle that has 180 identical protein subunits. So all we've done is gone from a 60 subunit containing particle. We've now added three times more, 180 subunits. We can make a bigger virus particle. Now we have some differences. This is why we no longer have identical interactions in most viruses, because as they get bigger, we add uh, these, these different interactions. And I think you can see here, we've got uh, different colored subunits here to emphasize this. We have some purple ones and some yellow ones, some orange ones and some gray ones. Now here is a five-fold axis of symmetry. You have one, two, three, four, five copies of that subunit around it. That's the same thing I showed you previously on the simple, simple virus particles. But the effect of adding more subunits to make a bigger capsid is that you now have a hexamer, which means simply there's a, a, an axis around which there are six copies of the subunit. Here in blue, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the pentamer is the five-fold axis, and then we have hexamers. Pentamer simply means there are five copies of the subunit around it. The hexamer simply means there are six subunits around it. So that's the consequence of adding more subunits. You now disrupt the identical interactions, and you get what we call quasi-identical interactions, right? They're quasi-identical because they're also head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail, -tail, as in the simpler viruses, but we have clearly different environments in the particle. We have hexamers and pentamers. So they cannot be identical interactions. So the word quasi-equivalent was coined to describe what happens as you make virus particles bigger. So whenever a capsid has more than 60 subunits, each will occupy a quasi-equivalent position. So the 61 that I showed you where you have a, a virus made up of 60 subunits of the same protein, those are all engaged in equivalent interactions, but equivalent and identical. But as soon as you put more subunits in to make a bigger particle, then you have quasi-equivalents, all right? So all that means is the non-covalent binding properties of subunits in different environments are similar but not identical. And the way you can remember it is there are pentamers and hexamers. That's, that's good enough to remember that there are two kinds of environments uh, on the virus particle. So here's an example of a larger virus where we now have hexamers and pentamers. This is SV40. It stands for simian virus 40. It was originally identified as a contaminant in the preparations of poliovirus vaccines made in the 1950s because they were grown in monkey kidney cells and the monkeys were all infected with this virus. So we didn't know about this virus and it ended up, we ended up giving it to many, many millions of people. And then people started to study it because it was small and easy to study, and we study it to this day. And as you will see, it's going gonna, it's gonna to play a role in a lot of the, uh, the work we talk about. It's a 50 nanometer particle, so it's bigger than the ones we talk about, bigger than the parvovirus. Um, it has 72 pentamers of VP1, which gives you 360 subunits. So these, these colored... Uh, structural units here, or subunits, are pentamers. Five copies of a single protein VP1. Each VP1 is colored differently uh, in these around the five-fold axis. The one here in the middle uh, is colored all purple because that's the one which is a pentamer. It's surrounded by five neighbors. One, two, three, four, five. To make this virus bigger than the others we've talked about, you had to add more subunits, so that should give you hexamers. So can we find a hexamer? Yes. Look at this one with the different colors. It's surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six pentamers. So they're all pentamers, right? The VP1 in those pentamers are engaged in identical interactions among themselves, but they in interact differently with their neighboring pentamers depending on whether, the neighboring subunits, depending on whether they're in a pentamer arrangement or a hexamer arrangement. So that's a consequence of making a bigger virus particle. 
Now, the, the last concept um, we need to talk about is T number, which stands for triangulation number, because we'll, we'll talk about this often throughout this course. It's very simple. It's actually a mathematical equation that describes it, but I will not uh, show it to you nor make you understand it. If you want to, it's in the textbook. Here's the easiest definition. The number of facets per triangular face of an icosahedron. Really simple. So here is T equals 1 on the left. These are two facets of an icosahedron. We've just, we're just showing these two, not the whole icosahedron. Uh, here, this one is defined as T equals 1. Even though it has three subunits, this is considered a single facet. And the one on the right is at T equals 4. You can see now the triangular face is bigger, and there are one, two, three, four facets. So this is an effect of making a bigger capsid. You add more subunits, you, you get a bigger capsid, but you're also adding to the number of facets in a triangular face. And all the T number is, is the number of facets in that face. And any capsid with a T greater than one will automatically have a six-fold axis of symmetry or a hexamer because you're putting in additional subunits to do that. So let's look at the effect of T number on the size of the particle. I think this is a very informative slide here. We start at the top. We have a T equals one capsid. This is the simplest one where we have, here is the structural unit on the left. It's a single polypeptide and that constitutes, sorry, it's, it's one polypeptide repeated three times and that constitutes the triangular face. And so there's one facet in that triangular face. It's a T equals one. And when you build the capsid, you can see uh, how that relates to the rest of the structure. So there are a total of 60 subunits uh, in that capsid. When you go to T equals three, that's the next one down. We now have a structural unit uh, where we have three facets. They're colored blue, yellow, and yellow. We now assemble a pentamer from that. You can see this is the triangular face of the icosahedron. It has three facets and it makes a bigger virus particle. And there are 180 subunits. So the T number not only describes the triangular face, uh, but if you multiply it times the number uh, of of subunits, you get the total number of subunits in the particle. Here is a T equals four, it gets even bigger. We're now adding four facets to the triangular face. You can see that in the middle right there. T equals four, 240 subunits. So 60 times T would give you the number of subunits. And finally, a really big virus, T equals 13. We have 13 facets in this triangular face. Now, I understand that the, the, the term facet may not mean anything to you because you have to take my word that each of these is a facet. And as I said, it is described mathematically, so there are uh, proper equations to describe this. But I think the simplest way to look at it is to look at that triangular face and simply count the number of facets in it. And, uh, and you do have to take our word that you know, this is 1, 3, 4, and 13 facets. So that's what the T number is. It, it increases with the size of the virus, and it can tell you the total number of subunits on a virus particle. Again, this applies just for icosahedral symmetry. All right, what, which of the following are characteristics of icosahedral symmetry in viral capsids? A, produces a solid with 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle. B, allows formation of a closed shell with 60 identical subunits. C, five-fold, three-fold, and two-fold axes of symmetry. D, the T number describes the number of facets per icosahedral face, and E, all of the above. All right, most of you got E, which is correct, 79%. All the above, it's a, it's a solid with 20 faces, it's an equilateral triangle, it makes a closed shell with 60 identical subunits. That's certainly a property. It can have more, but the minimum can be 60. There are five threefold and twofold axes. The T number is the number of facets per icosahedral face. Now, I've described to you some rather small and simple uh, virus particles, but viruses do get more complicated. They not only get bigger by adding more subunits, but they can get complicated. So I just want to show you a few examples of that and what it means to be more complicated. This is adenovirus, uh, which I've shown you already in electron micrograph is. It's an icosahedral capsid, very much like poliovirus sitting here, but it has a lot of other proteins besides the ones, besides the subunits that we've been talking about making up the shell. So obviously it has proteins that make up these fibers and those fibers, by the way, are attached at each five-fold axis of symmetry. So it's attached to a protein called the penton base because that's a pentamer, 
at the five-fold axis of symmetry. You also have hexons making up the capsid because those are surrounded by six neighbors, right? Because this is a bigger capsid. And then you have, for example, proteins in between the hexons. These are considered to be holding the hexon proteins together. You have lots of proteins bound to the viral DNA uh, that, that are involved in, in its function and a variety of other structural proteins that we haven't considered. So these don't contribute to the overall symmetry of the capsid. They have other functions in the capsid, but the point is uh, that many big viruses are often built with what we call accessory proteins that go beyond establishing the, the symmetry of the capsid itself. So that's one example of a complicated virus. Another one uh, are the real viruses. And these are RNA, double-stranded RNA containing viruses. They're icosahedral in nature, but they have two shells. They have an outer and an inner shell. And that's diagrammed on the left here. You can see an outer shell, uh, which is in purple. And then there's an inner shell, which is beige colored. These are actually two separate icosahedral capsids and they're built with different T numbers. They're shown here ind independently on the right in these uh, cryo-EM structures. The inner layer is shown here. It is built of VP3 monomers with a T equals two triangulation number. So two uh, facets per icosahedral face. And then the outer layer is shown on the left. It's actually a T equals three capsid made with VP7 trimers. Now, why do you need two concentric shells? Well, you'll see when we talk about uncoding of this virus that when this virus enters the cell, uh, the outer coating is stripped off and the inner coating always remains. The RNA synthesis actually takes place in the inner shell. So for that virus, it needs to have two shells. It never actually gets out of that inner shell. Bacteriophages are built with, many of them are built with the symmetries we have discussed. If you're familiar with the tailed phages, like the one shown here, it has an icosahedral head the head contains the DNA. This is built with icosahedral symmetry exactly as we've been talking about uh, for these spherical viruses. Uh, then you typically have a tail, which is a helically symmetry built uh, tail. It's made up of uh, proteins joined to one another in a helix, very much like the helices that make up the nucleocapsids of the viruses we talk about. And then there's typically a base plate for attaching to the cell and tail fibers as well, which probably help in stabilizing the virus as it attaches to a bacterial cell. So these are complicated because they're made of components with different symmetry, the head and the tail, for example. Now, uh, even more interesting is at the bottom end of these tails, this is where the DNA typically comes out. The DNA is stored in the head of the bacteriophage. And when these attach to a cell, the DNA passes from the head through the tail and goes into the cell. And many phages have a spike at the bottom of the tail, which pierces a hole in the bacterial membrane and allows the DNA to come through. And recently, the structure of one of these spikes was solved. So here in, in panel B, uh, you can see a cryo-EM structure of the bottom. Of the, this is called the base plate in green. The, the tail of the phage is in yellow. The base plate in red at the bottom is the spike, which inserts uh, into the cell membrane. And on the right are two representations magnified of this spike. Uh, in the middle is a space filling diagram. And you can see it's a trimer. It's made of three copies of the same protein. And on the right is a ribbon diagram of the same structure. So you're removing all the atoms. We're just looking at the alpha carbon trace now. You can see there are a lot of beta sheets uh, in this, beta strands making up beta sheets in this protein. And I'm just amazed that it actually is a spike because the protein arranges in a way so that at the very end there's a tip that pierces through the membrane. And these three subunits are actually held together by a single molecule of iron, which is this little orange ball down here. It's holding through the three subunits so that when this uh, tail hits the membrane of the bacterium, this, this uh, spike pierces through and makes a hole and then the DNA goes through it. Now, uh, probably the spike has to fall off so the DNA can come out. We don't know how that happens, but I think this is amazing. This actually looks like a spike and you can see the way the beta strands are arranged to form that spike structure. One other uh, very complicated virus I want to tell you about because we'll come back to herpes virus. It's one of our model viruses. This is a large DNA containing virus, the DNA is encased in an icosahedral capsid. So it's built with icosahedral symmetry, 
uh, just the way we've been talking about. Here on the right in panel B is the structure of just the nucleocapsid, the DNA protein complex. And again, it's a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure in an envelope virus. Uh, so that is the, uh, cap the nucleocapsid of herpes virus. So it's very big. Uh, it's a T equals 16, 200 nanometer capsid. So automatically you know it's got to have pentons and hexons. It's got five-fold and six-fold associated subunits. And you can see them colored on this structure in B. Uh, most of these blue subunits are hexons. They're surrounded by six neighbors. And the red ones are surrounded by five. Now, all of this is symmetrical with one exception. There is one um, five-fold associated uh, penton, which is actually a portal. And that's shown right here on the right. Um, it is a portal, and we think DNA comes in, goes in and comes out of this portal during assembly and disassembly. On the left is an electron micrograph of the particle, and it's, it's labeled with antibodies against the portal protein, so you can see them labeled here. In the middle is a cryo-EM reconstruction of the portal. So again, this is just one of the, this is substituting for one of the pentons that's in the particle, uh, and it has a hole in it so that the DNA can come in and out. It's another example of how you can build a complicated virus to achieve different things. Now, many uh, capsids are covered by membranes. This is always derived from the host cell because viruses do not encode lipid synthesizing machinery. Um, and this can be acquired uh, at very different membranes in the cell. It can be acquired at the nuclear, the, pla the uh, ER, the Golgi, or the plasma membrane. It's always the same for each virus, but it can be from different places. Uh, and here is shown a process of one virus acquiring a, an envelope as it buds out from the plasma membrane. We'll talk about this process in more detail. Uh, but the nucleocapsids inside the envelope, they can be helical or icosahedral. Now, this is an example on this slide of a retrovirus. Uh, this is probably HIV, which has a capsid inside an envelope. And within the capsid is a nucleocapsid. It's an RNA protein structure. Now, this model I'm showing you here, this, this uh, giant microbes, HIV, is shown with icosahedral symmetry. But this is an envelope virus, so you would not be seeing any icosahedral symmetry. You should see just a spherical envelope around it. That's why the HIV of giant microbes isn't right. Now, when viruses have envelopes, they often have glycoproteins embedded in the envelope, which they use to attach to host cells. These are integral membrane glycoproteins, and they have ectodomains, which are outside of the virus particle. Uh, these typically are used for attachment to receptors in the cell. They have antigenic sites. They have fusion activity, as we will see. They, all, they have transmembrane domains, and they have parts on the inside of the virus particle as well. So this could be a viral membrane. This could be the outside of the virus on the exterior and the interior, and you can see the different parts. Now, when you take an EM, of virus particles as shown on the lower left. This is influenza virus. You can't often see the individual spikes because the resolution of EM isn't enough. But you can see groups of, of them together and you can get this, uh, this appearance on the surface of the particle. And at, many years ago, they were called spikes. And these are typically oligomers of integral membrane proteins that are big enough so that you can see them. But you can't see the individual polypeptides. Here are two examples of spike glycoproteins for two different viruses. On the left is the hemagglutin of, of influenza virus. It's a trimer of one polypeptide repeated three times. And you can see it's perpendicular to the membrane. Here on the bottom is a model of the influenza virus. Uh, and these HA hemagglutinin molecules are shown in blue. So you can see they project from the virus. And these are going to be used to attach to cells. But they're also directed, uh, antibodies that block infection are directed against these proteins as well. We'll talk more about them later. But some viral glycoproteins lie parallel to the membrane. This is, a, on the right, a flavivirus uh, glycoprotein. It's called the E glycoprotein. It's a dimer. And on the bottom is a cryo-EM reconstruction of the flavivirus. So you can see that these are lying flat on the virus surface. Zika virus is a flavivirus, so it probably looks something like this. In general, viruses with envelopes can be unstructured or structured. So at the top, we have, on the left, influenza virus. On the right, Ebola virus. They have a helical nucleocapsid, that is an RNA protein helix inside, and the envelope around it. These are unstructured because they are rather amorphous. They're spherical or filamentous. 
on the bottom is, is a, again, our flavivirus. It's an envelope virus with the glycoprotein lying flat on the surface of the particle as opposed to perpendicular as for influenza virus. And on the right is a diagram of that. You can see that nicely. So you can see the, the dimer that makes up the viral glycoprotein is flat on the surface. Now these viruses, the nucleocapsid is actually built with icosahedral symmetry. You can see that in the middle. The RNA is shown in green. Uh, and then the capsid protein is shown in blue. And if you could see the structure of that, you would recognize it as an I built with icosahedral symmetry. There's five-fold axes of symmetry, for example. But because this capsid contacts the viral glycoproteins uh, that come through the membrane, the, me the glycoproteins on the surface of the particle actually assume the symmetry of the underlying capsid. That's why here on the left is a cryo-EM of the particle. This is the outer surface with the viral glycoproteins. You can see there's a five-fold axis of symmetry there. And this rarely happens in membrane containing viruses like influenza viruses because there's no underlying icosahedral symmetry to do that. But the flaviviruses are special in that they look icosahedral because the glycoproteins uh, mimic the underlying icosahedral structure. Now, you may say, why, why isn't that the case with HIV? It could, in theory, that be that the HIV glycoproteins mimic a capsid underneath, but that we know that not to be the case for HIV. Uh, in fact, the HIV glycoproteins do not assume the symmetry of the underlying capsid. It's only the flaviviruses do that. So that's another reason why this giant microbe isn't quite right. So if you ever start a giant microbe company, one day you'll be able to get it right, I hope. Now, last, the last kind of virus structure, which I alluded to before, we call these complex viruses. They don't have helical symmetry. They don't have icosahedral symmetry. They're just really big and really complicated and they've been called complex. And some examples are shown here. Pox virus, a really big virus particle. It's double membraned. It has a core of DNA with many different proteins. It doesn't really fit into any of the symmetries we know about. Uh, on the right is pithovirus, a giant DNA virus. It's an enveloped virus, you can see. Uh, and it's apparently got some uh, proteins embedded in the envelope. It's got a, an unusual structure in the middle, which we think is DNA. And then at one end, this striated structure, which has been called the cork. People think that this holds the DNA in when the virus uncoats, the cork pops out. Uh, and then on the lower left is a Pandora virus, the biggest virus we know of, one micron, 1,000 nanometers in length. And again, it's weird. It has a double membrane. It's got a pore at one end and a very amorphous interior with DNA. So we don't know, we don't know how these are built because they don't follow the principles of helical or icosahedral symmetry, but we'll certainly be talking about them a lot in this course. I also want to tell you at the very end here that besides the structural proteins of virus particles and other proteins that make fibers or that help glue the capsomeres together, the, the structural units together, virus particles have lots of other things in them as well. Some of them are listed here. They can have enzymes of all sorts in the virus particle, polymerases and integrases for the retroviruses, proteases, uh, enzymes that make nucleic acids, topoisomerases. These can all be found in some virus particles. Uh, they can also have proteins that are needed for transcription, activators of transcription, uh, proteins that degrade mRNA, proteins needed for efficient defection, and even some viruses even have mRNAs in them so that they can be released immediately and translated in proteins that are needed for replication. And indeed, some viruses we are learning pick up cellular components that they use. And examples are histones, tRNAs, uh, various lipids, and many, many more. We used to think that, for example, when a virus envelope budded from a cell, it only had viral proteins in it, but that's not the case. And these whole have virus functions. So today you now have an overview of how every virus is built. And when we go through some of them one by one, you can really understand how they come together uh, and uh, come apart in a new cell.